Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Sarah Walcott, Collections Manager at the International Quilt Museum, and I'm here today to tell you five things you may not know about how we care for our collection. As you may be aware, the International Quilt Museum houses the world's largest publicly held collection of quilts. This means that taking care of them requires the effort and coordination of many people, including our wonderful volunteers. The first question we often get is how are quilts cleaned? Many people are used to cleaning quilts in their own homes using a washing machine or other methods of cleaning, of wet cleaning or cleaning with soaps or other detergents. However, at the International Quilt Museum, the only cleaning we do is vacuuming. You can see our wonderful volunteer Louise here working on an extremely large quilt. She's using a screen, as you can see, that screen covers the face of the quilt so that no fibers are removed during the vacuuming process. You can see also that she's wearing gloves to protect the quilt from the oils on her hands. And she's using a museum grade variable speed vacuum on its lowest setting. So we also don't touch the vacuum to the surface of the quilt or even the screen. You have to hover right above it. So it's kind of an art and Louise is an amazing and dedicated vacuum volunteer for us. The reason we vacuum the quilts is to pull out dust because on a microscopic level, dust has sharp edges that can damage the fibers of the quilt. So each new acquisition that comes in is vacuumed and each of our permanent collection quilts is vacuumed once it comes out of isolation after being exhibited. Another question we often get is how our quilts are stored. This image illustrates our main collection storage. This is the way the vast majority of our collection is stored in acid free boxes. They're placed on these space saving shelves, as you can see, and they're organized by their accession numbers. So each quilt is assigned its very own object number which coordinates to the year it came in, the acquisition within the year, and the piece within that acquisition. So then uh, the quilts are layered with acid-free tissue when they're folded, and then with more tissue in between and on the top and bottom of the box, they're placed into acid-free archival quality boxes. And this allows us to store thousands of quilts in a pretty efficient manner. We also have other methods of storage, including rolled storage and flat storage. Those would be used for quilts that for one reason or another can't be folded. So often our rolled quilts might include art quilts that are um, embellished or machine quilted in a way that makes it impossible to fold them. Um, our flat storage often houses some of our more fragile and our older pieces from the collection that aren't able to be folded. And also sometimes our art pieces that might be painted or might have heavy embellishment or heavy machine quilting that makes even rolling an impossibility. It's all about balancing the needs of individual quilts with the needs of the overall collection. Why is environmentally, environmental monitoring so important? So here you can see our collections curator, Carolyn Ducey, standing in isolation, examining a quilt that had just come in. So everything that comes into the museum, whether it's a loan or a new acquisition, passes through isolation at first. So isolation is exactly what it sounds like. Each quilt spends two weeks in a sealed bag after a visual inspection. And the purpose of this is to make sure that there are not any insect, any forms of insect life living on that quilt. So it's really important that we don't introduce any pests into the collection that could pose a danger to any of our quilts or textiles. So that two week period is long enough to kill any stage of the life cycle of any pest that we might be concerned about. The main ones we look for are carpet beetles, wool moths, and clothes moths. On the right, you can see our collections assistant, Jamie Swartz. 
he is examining one of our 34 bug traps that are all around the museum. So these traps are blunder traps. Um, they do not attract bugs. They're sort of a census taking for us. So once a month, we pick them all up from all around the building and examine each one under the microscope and tally up. As you can see, Jamie's got a notebook there. We tally up every single insect and we identify the species. If we have any concerns, we're able to reach out to facilities and the entomology department on East Campus, and they help us identify what the insect is and um, any treatment that might be necessary in order to mitigate it. So another piece of environmental monitoring that's very important is temperature and humidity. So our collections workroom and collection storage are temperature and humidity controlled at a year around 68 degrees and 45 to 55% relative humidity. This is monitored every hour on the hour and we keep track of it with a special monitor that sits in the stacks where the boxes are. So that's just helping us make sure that we're keeping the collection as safe as possible at a temperature that's good for textiles and avoiding any fluctuations in temperature or humidity that could cause the fibers of the quilts to expand and contract, which weakens them. Um, high humidity, of course, can also lead to mold and mildew, which is another thing we're very wary of. So it's really important that we monitor the environment, both from pests as well as temperature and humidity, to keep our collection safe and to give it as much longevity as we possibly can. Another question we often get is why do we refold our quilts? Here we have two of our wonderful volunteers, Kathy Murphy and Kathy Bombach. They are refolding our quilts. Um, the reason that we do this is to do a visual inspection of the quilt. So this is done for every quilt every two years. So the visual inspection is important. We just kind of take a look, make sure the correct quilts are in the correct box, make sure we're not seeing anything concerning in terms of deterioration. And then the biggest reason is just that those quilts develop fold lines um, along the lines where, of course, they have been previously folded. And so we try to evenly distribute that stress over the face of the quilt through refolding. So for instance, if um, a quilt is unfolded east to west, then the volunteers will refold it north to south. Also taking care by looking at the tissue on the face of the quilt to see where it was folded previously, maybe not even the time that they, the immediate previous time, but even a time or two before that, they try to look at the tissue and determine where it's previously been folded and also look at the quilt to determine that and then make sure that they're refolding on a different line. The reason that fold lines cause so much damage is that they do break the fibers down over time and they can even create cracks and holes in the quilt. So we never refold our quilts in halves or in quarters because most of the historic quilts that come to us have been refolded that way so many times that they already have heavy fold lines in those areas. So we avoid the center of the quilt in either direction and we also refold to fit back in the sides of our acid-free boxes. Finally, I'd like to talk about the roles of curation and exhibition in collections care. It's not simply the job of our immediate collections management staff to take care of the quilts or our volunteers. Everyone in the museum has some role in caring for the collection, particularly our curators and our exhibitions team. In this illustration from an exhibit, you can see that the quilt in the center is being displayed flat. Now, sometimes this could be an aesthetic choice, but often it's due to the condition of the quilt. Exhibitions and collections are constantly trying to balance being able to exhibit as many pieces and as varied pieces from our collection as possible without causing harm to the quilt that will mean that it can't be exhibited anymore. So often that might be a slant board or in this case, a flat platform for the quilt to rest on. That way 
the weight is distributed evenly across the whole thing. It's not hanging from a sleeve and a slat. Many quilts are strong enough for that, some aren't. And so in this case, we would do something like this to take the stress off that quilt and make it so that people are still able to come and see it. The role of our curators is also extremely important in curating our collection. This photo here is uh, not a quilt from our collection. It's one I pulled off the internet. Um, but it's a good example of the type of quilt that we might be offered as a donation. Um, and so our curators have three things they use to determine whether or not a quilt is going to enter the collection, whether it's a donation or a purchase. Those are the condition of the quilt, the provenance of the quilt. So who made it? What do we know about them? What do we know about who else has owned it? What do we know about why the quilt was made? and also just the rarity of the quilt within our collection. So for example, our 19th and 20th century American quilt collection numbers in the thousands. So it would probably be pretty unlikely that we would accept a donation of a 19th or 20th century American quilt simply because there are not very many gaps left in our collection of those quilts. However, we do partner with many other museums who are looking to build their quilt collections and who would gladly accept that type of donation. So we are able to pass that information along, contact information for other museums to potential donors who have a quilt that we might not be able to use, but might make a really valuable addition to the collection of another museum. We, on the other hand, if someone wanted to donate or sell an international piece, that might be something that we, in an area of our collection that we're really looking to build. And so that might be a little bit more likely to be accepted. It really just depends. So condition is really the biggest thing that determines the growth of the collection in terms of donations, because most donations that are offered to us um, have condition issues that mean they're just not able to be exhibited. Um, this one is a good example. You can see that this quilt top has been um, washed a lot and that perhaps the seam allowances that the original quilter used were not quite big enough. And so we've got a lot of popped open seams. And so, um, and also just the fact that it's a top, it's pretty hard to exhibit tops since it's very hard to attach a sleeve to them. And so this would be an example of something that we would unfortunately have to turn away as a donation. Textiles break down um, for a lot of reasons. Light is the biggest one. And so um, that often leads to the condition issues that we see in quilts. Light degradation is cumulative and irreversible. And so for your quilts at home, you just really wanna make sure that you're doing everything you can to keep them out of the light. Um, and that will stop them from not only fading, but also from weakening those fibers to the point that they eventually start to disintegrate. So thank you for joining us for five things you may not have known about how we care for our collection at the International Quilt Museum.